The scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 9, uh, and we're going to actually do uh, verses 1 through 9. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice, but they saw no one. And Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days... He was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Friends, here ends the lesson. May God transform understanding into action. Amen. apologize in advance for my voice. I hope that you all can hold on with me. I hope my voice holds on. So, Our gospel readings since Easter Sunday two Sundays ago have been accounts of Jesus encountering different people since his death and resurrection three days later. This is important for us as readers because it is setting the stage for us to understand what those days after Jesus's resurrection were like. Anyone who knew and believed in Jesus had certainly been on a roller coaster ride of emotions. First, there's the tragic murder of Jesus. Then the bizarre day where no one knew where Jesus' body went. And then the strange tale of Jesus being resurrected in the process of trying to figure out what that means. The days that followed, the followers of Jesus probably had no idea how to proceed. When I imagine what those days were like, I often picture total quiet. People kind of staying inside, doing a lot of mental processing. No one really being willing to take the first step. No one feels capable of speaking to what just happened, let alone speaking up in defense of Jesus or God's kingdom. So in those quiet and uncertain days, Jesus starts making appearances to select people. And these appearances are as bizarre as those days must have felt. But these connections between Jesus and his followers are critical because they are emboldening people to step out and tell the truth about what happened to Jesus and, more importantly, what is supposed to happen now. There is a mission and a purpose behind what happened to Jesus in those days, and, of course, we know that. And the Christians for whom these accounts, like the account of Acts, were written, they knew that. But the characters in the story don't yet know. They are in the midst of figuring it out. First, figuring out that there's the immediate impact of Jesus' death atoning for the sins of the world, and Jesus' resurrection inviting new hope and new life. There's now forgiveness and there's freedom. But then there's also the future impact that they have to figure out. That forgiveness and freedom enables action. Followers of Jesus now have a job to do. They're expected to rid themselves of the guilt and worry that bogged them down before and think ahead to future possibilities. Now the freedom and forgiveness needs to be extended to the whole world. But if you are the characters in this story... You aren't thinking about that future impact. 
you probably aren't even totally wrapping your head around the present impact of forgiveness and freedom and what that means. You're just trying to understand the moment. But if we do, if we as a community know about the present and future impact, why do we spend so many weeks after Easter reading about the biblical characters, figuring it out? What is there for us to learn? What is the Bible speaking to us in these texts about Jesus' encounters after the resurrection? <clears throat> I ask these questions and I share all of this with you because I always think it is helpful to have this context before zooming in on a famous text like the Saul conversion. Because it's easy for us to focus on the miraculous power of God to change even a heart of stone and to get stuck there. Or to get hung up on asking salvation questions and asking what this text tells us about who gets commissioned for ministry and get stuck there. Or to marvel at the greatness of God's forgiveness and to get stuck there. While each of these truths will preach, certainly, I believe each of these also miss the heart of what is really important for us to learn and would get us stuck. <clears throat> the Christians who are reading the account of Acts know who Saul is. They are aware that any encounter with Saul is a death wish for followers of Jesus. They will read this text and immediately be reminded of those they know that suffered at the hands of Saul. And ultimately, they know what a 180 his life will take later on. So if they know that peace, the peace that moves us into awe at God's power, there must be something else going on in this text that's important to them, that brings different meaning to this text. So in order for us to not get stuck, there are some nuances that are important for us to uncover. The first is this. People, of, people who were faithful to Jesus weren't known as Christians in those days. They were instead known as followers of the way. This is a powerful metaphor for the Christian identity. Instead of being identified by a set of beliefs, faith communities were known by their character in the world. The Christian faith, or following the teaching and work of Jesus, was a way of life and one that compelled individuals and communities to leave the confines of home and church to journey to where God led them. The way implies that faith, or for us being a Christian, is a living and active way of being. This was meant to re-engage the characters in our narrative to their work in the world and reminds us to step outside of our vacuums to respond faithfully to our call. The second nuance is this. Saul is on his own journey, one that involves persecuting those who are living into this active faith. He's taking to the streets to intimidate, imprison, and even kill those who are out sharing Jesus' message of God's love. Then he gets stopped by Jesus himself on the way. These encounters between Jesus and the faithful after Jesus' resurrection remind us that even though Jesus has departed from earth, his presence is ever more palpable. His nearness to us has never been stronger than it is now. Jesus is telling the characters in the story that by appearing to the faithful. And in turn, Jesus is telling us something about who he considers faithful. Because, of course, the question becomes, why Saul? Why appear to Saul if Jesus is appearing to the faithful? Well, friends, the message here is that it's easy for us to make judgments about people, who is in, who is out, who is called, who is not. But, of course, God's idea is totally different. The third nuance is that Jesus asks Saul why he insists on persecuting him indicating that when Saul is inflicting pain and suffering on the faithful followers of the way, he's really persecuting Jesus. 
Again, this implies that Jesus is near to us in a distinct way after the resurrection. When God's people suffer, God suffers. Jesus even goes as far as to say to Saul that he will suffer even greater persecution for God's sake, even greater than Saul himself could inflict, indicating that even in the greatest suffering, Jesus' spirit will be with us. Jesus' presence is even stronger and more near to us in our pain and suffering because Jesus suffered for us in the ultimate way. This is a new way of encountering Jesus for the characters in our story and for us is a comfort in stepping out boldly in our faith because we know Jesus is going to be with us. So pile all of these hidden messages of these nuances together and what do we get? Reminder that as God's chosen people, Jesus is going with us on our mission of spreading God's love and extensive grace with those along the way. That our call as post-Easter people is to extend this loving presence to everyone, including those we perceive as outsiders. And to not be afraid of doing so because of Jesus' near presence to us. I feel like I say this a lot in sermons, and I think it's because it's one of my biggest pet peeves of modern-day Christianity. But there are easy ways to read scripture, and there are more complicated approaches. The easy approach to this text is to know what happened, that Saul met Jesus and will be converted to Paul, and to even know why it happened, so that God's message could be spread throughout the world. The more complicated approach is to begin to see how this text can can shape our future as a community of God's people. So this Sunday is designated by the United Church of Christ as Immigrant Rights Sunday. The first Sunday in May is declared as a day to, quote, lift up immigrants to learn about their concerns, honor their contributions to our countries and our communities, to hear their pain, pray for their well-being, and to listen to hear where God is leading us regarding the issue of immigration. That is a quote from the UCC's website on what this day means. So our denomination believes this an important enough issue facing Christians right now that it's worth its own Sunday of remembrance. The tragedies surrounding immigrants in America are adding up to create a modern day human rights crisis. One that should offend us who believe in a loving and gracious God, especially so soon after Easter. If I'm being honest, I wrestled with so many different ways to approach the inclusion of Immigrant Rights Sunday in this sermon, especially thinking about how our text can shape the life of our community, living now and living into the future. I ultimately decided that less is more and to keep it simple. So I'm going to say this. As we gather around this table, communion table, a little bit later in this service, I want us to truly reflect on what we just celebrated two Sundays ago. God's body broken for us and Jesus' blood shed for all of humanity. And to think about all of us. Communion is the remembrance of what God has done and is an opportunity to share in the hope of our promised future and to have communion with one another. Therefore, communion is for all of us. Those that are gathered in this room and those outside of our walls that belong to this body. From the immigrant to the hard-hearted and to the faithful. Each one included in God's kingdom and used for God's mission in the world. The table represents God's love for all. And as we partake this morning, consider how you might move your faith from a set of beliefs to action. Because friends, we are freed and forgiven to move to action and love for ourselves, but for the immigrant, the hard-hearted, and the faithful as well. And ask, like Saul, where have we gone wrong in extending God's love and grace? How can we as a community learn from this text to do better for those being persecuted in our nation? 
I know that we can do better at widening the table before us. And I know that Jesus is going along with us on the way and that we can look to him for guidance. I know this because Jesus made sure to have his presence known because he wants to be known by us and he wants us to let others know about him. So this morning I ask, how are we doing? I'm not going to offer answers or suggestions, simply posing a question for you to ponder as we come before the Lord in communion this morning. Amen.